Good evening. Uh, welcome to our midweek Bible study and prayer time here at Merriman Road. And we're so glad that you're joining us tonight. And I hope that uh, the Lord will encourage you from His Word and that He will encourage you from the, both the potential and opportunity to join our hearts together in prayer. Now, we've been doing this for months now, uh, praying together, uh, even though physically we're not in the same room. But we understand that prayer is a spiritual exercise. And the God who is spirit is present in all places at all times. And so we know he's with us as we gather. And uh, we invite his presence among us for this time of prayer and preparation from God's word and petition uh, in united prayer. And so as we come to the Lord, as we enter into his presence, uh, we recognize that he is with us. So I'd ask you to do that right where you are, uh, that you'd praise the Lord with me, that you'd thank the Lord from your heart. Let's let the psalmist help us. Uh, in Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? For the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? For I have asked one thing from the Lord. It is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, and to seek Him in His temple. So, Lord, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious to me and answer me. My heart says this about you. Seek His face, Lord. I will seek Your face. I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. So wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. Oh, the psalmist encourages our hearts to, to recognize that the Lord hears us when we pray, that He is near us even today, and that we should thank Him and praise Him for these wonderful promises that give us hope. I want to ask you to join me it's in a time of prayer of of praise and thanksgiving uh, tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for the precious gift that it is to us, for the precious opportunity to be able to come into your presence. Lord, we recognize tonight that we don't deserve it. We're not worthy of your presence, but you have invited us. And by the promise of your word, we, we come humbly before you. And we seek your presence. We, we want to be near you and to seek your face. And so we do today, Lord. We, we thank you and we praise you for these invitations and for this confidence that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, it's not a confidence in ourselves, but it's a confidence in you and in the power of your word and the promise and presence of your Holy Spirit. So we ask for you to be among us and as we open your word tonight that you speak to our hearts or words of life that we need to hear. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, over the last couple of months, we have been working our way through the book of Daniel. And tonight we come to Daniel chapter 10. Now this, is, this chapter is not one of explanation or vision, although it is dramatic and uh, amazing. But it is, I'd have you to see, uh, an answer to prayer, a, a miraculous and marvelous answer to prayer. And so I think it's appropriate tonight that as we come together to pray together, that we are reminded from God's Word of the power of prayer. And so I'm going to read the whole chapter and invite you, if you want to turn there along with me, to Daniel chapter 10. And then we're going to come back and consider the implications of this story that's been given to us. To see that God, through these words, is giving us a portal into the spiritual world. To begin to understand a little bit of that which we cannot see. And so, join me. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of King Cyrus of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel whose name is Belshazzar. The message was true and was about great, a great conflict. He understood the message 
and had understanding of the vision. And in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. I didn't eat any rich food or meat or wine entered into my mouth, and I didn't put any oil on my body until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up, and there was a man dressed in linen with a belt of gold from Upaz. Around, that was around his waist, and his body was like burl, and his face was like the brilliance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and feet gleamed of polished bronze, and the sound of his words was like the sound of a multitude. Only I, Daniel, saw the vision. The men who were with me did not see it, but great terror fell on them, and they ran and they hid. I was left alone, looking at this great vision. No strength was left in me. My face grew deadly pale, and I was powerless. I heard the words said, and when I heard them, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Suddenly, a hand touched me and set me shaking on my hands and knees. He said to me, Daniel, you are a man treasured by God. Understand the words that I am saying to you. Stand on your feet, for I have now been sent to you. After he said this, I stood trembling. Don't be afraid, Daniel, he said to me. For from the first day that you purposed to understand and you humbled yourself before your God, your prayers were heard. I have come because of your prayers. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me after I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to help you understand what has happened to your people in the last days. For the vision refers to those days. While he was saying these things, to, these words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and was speechless. Suddenly one with human likeness touched my lips. I opened my mouth and I said to the, to the one standing in front of me, My Lord... Because of the vision, anguish overwhelms me, and I'm powerless. How can someone like me, your servant, speak with someone like you, my Lord? Now I have no strength, and there is no breath in me. Then the one with the human appearance touched me again and strengthened me. And he said, Don't be afraid, for you are treasured by God. Peace to you. Be very strong. He spoke to me, and I was strengthened. And he said, and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. He said, do you not know, or do you know why I have come to you? For I must return once to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I leave, the prince of Greece will come. However, I will tell you what is recorded in the book of truth. No one has the courage to support me in this except Michael, your prince. All right, let's pause, stop here. And we're just going to ask God to... Uh, bless us with understanding and application for our lives from this, from this passage of Scripture. It may, in its, in its first blush, as your first reading, it may sound very confusing, but I hope to, uh, to help shed some light on its, on its meaning for us because I, I find it to be very, a very important revelation uh, from God's Word. But I, I want to begin with this understanding. And that is that praying in faith is, essential, is an essential part of our life in Christ. Prayer is this, an effective and wonderful gift that God has given to us. And through prayer, we are engaging that which is unseen. I know we talk about prayer in our circles very often. We talk about prayer at church, in our, in our small groups. Uh, we, but rarely, I think, Rarely we really consider what prayer does. We know that prayer is calling out to God. It's responding to God in, in confession and praise and thanksgiving. It's asking God by petition and intercession for others. But as we look at Daniel's example for us, as we look at Daniel's conversation with the angel, we gain an important perspective that prayer is a part of of unseen realities, of unseen spiritual warfare. See, what we know about Daniel from our, our readings as we've been working through the book 
is that Daniel was a man of prayer. He was a man of great faith, and that faith was expressed in his faithfulness to pray. And because of that, we see how God used him. We see his determination to faithfulness, his willingness to be used of God, his dedication to the truth, even if that truth would mean his death. We've seen that he prayed three times a day openly. And in a wonderful way, God answers his prayer. When he prayed for wisdom, and I want you to hear this. When Daniel prayed for wisdom, God gave him wisdom. Don't you need some wisdom in your life? I know I do. So why, do we, why do we abdicate such a wonderful gift given to us? God desires to give you wisdom. James tells us that anyone who asks for wisdom, God freely gives it. We need his wisdom, and it, it comes as we come to him in prayer. Daniel understood this. Daniel understood the power of prayer, and therefore he, he gave himself to it. It's demonstrated in this passage. For what Daniel's doing is responding to a need. Now, we're not really told what it is. You know, we're given, you, given a time frame, and that helps us, maybe helps us understand what it could be. But there is a, a message that he's received, and, and Daniel's very uh, concerned about it. And his concern leads him to prayer. As I said, we're given the timing, right? It's the third year of Cyrus. And many of the chapters of Daniel are, are given a date uh, by that, in, in that way, by the year of the uh, p- particular king or emperor. The third year of Cyrus would be the la- last date we're given in the book of Daniel. Uh, it would mark, it would be about two years after uh, the returning exiles have come to Jerusalem. Now, just to set that in frame, uh, perspective, it, uh, remind you that Daniel was taken to captivity. Uh, Jeremiah uh, told them that 70 years, it would be 70 years before the remnant would return. And in the first year of Cyrus, the remnant returns. The book of Ezra records this for us. Uh, and so if we look at that time frame, we're saying, okay, they've been in Jerusalem now for two years, and there's likely a couple things that are distressing Daniel as he's received this message. One of those things would be the lack of progress in the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, Cyrus, when Cyrus decreed this, when he set, set the Jews back to Jerusalem and sent them back with the uh, the implements of the temple. They went back under Ezra's leadership to rebuild the temple. But yet, after two years, all that they were able to accomplish was the building of the foundation. Day after day, three times a day, Daniel would pray towards the temple, but the temple's not rebuilt. It may be that he receives word about this lack of progress, and that's disturbing to him. But another thing that would clearly disturb him would be the fact that there were were over 100,000 Jews living in Babylon. And when Cyrus decreed that the Jews could go back to Jerusalem, one would have thought that they would have all gone back to Jerusalem. But the reality is only 42,000 returned to Jerusalem. Most of the Jews had become comfortable in foreign lands. And so they chose to remain there. Daniel, we read earlier, had prayed for this day, prayed for the day of returning. But we cannot find in the book of Daniel the reason that Daniel himself was unable to return. He was likely in his early 90s. It could have been age. But quite likely it was his responsibilities in the the king's court that has disturbed him and and is his reason that he could not return to Jerusalem. Whatever it is, we we don't know what it is that has fully disturbed Daniel. But we can see how he deals, and this is what's, I think, important for us tonight. How does he deal with that which troubles his soul? 
Does he complain? Does he gripe? No, he prays. He sets a course of action which is fully dependent upon the resources of God. Brother and sister, we need, we need to really consider that. As we look at our own actions, at our own response to troubles that come into our life, things that disturb us, how do we respond? We often respond emotionally, and, and we cocoon in on ourselves, and, and we complain, and, and, and internally we become depressed. My friend, we have a positive action, a way to respond that has been given to us really through our Lord Jesus Christ who has redeemed us and made it possible for us to enter into the very throne room of God. And that way is prayer. So when Daniel is disturbed, verse 2 says, And I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no, no meat, no wine touched my lips. I used no lotions until the three weeks were over. This is describing his, his process of a fast He's serious about his prayers. His heart is disturbed, and so he he enters into his prayers in special dedication to seek wisdom from God and to understand what God is doing. You know, as I read that, he prays for three weeks, and we see what happens as he prays for three weeks, the angel comes into his presence. He has this powerful vision. We're going to read it in a minute. But I, I can't help but ask the question, I wonder, what if he just prayed for one day? What if he'd just come to God and said, God, I'm disturbed, I'm, I'm upset, I, I really don't know uh, what's going on here, I don't understand why. And he asked God to, um, to, to give him an answer and then, then stop praying. What if he'd only prayed for three days? Or maybe just seven days? Could it be that this is why Jesus, <laughs> Jesus tells us that we are to always pray and never give up? Because we don't understand everything that's going on out there in the spiritual world. We do not understand what might be hindering the answer to that prayer or what, what, what obstacles are in the way. We don't understand God's timetable. But we can understand that God calls us to be faithful. I don't understand all there is to know about angels and demons, trust me. I don't know much more any more than you do. But I'm excited to have this, this glimpse into the spiritual world. They will see into this, this part of our reality that we don't see with our eyes. Have you ever gone to a theatrical play? Uh, I, I, I enjoy going to, to plays or musicals. You know, and you, you watch that first scene, and, and your eyes are attracted to the, uh, the sets that are there, and then they close the curtains, and they open the curtains, and everything's changed. And you're left wondering, how did they do that? You know, and you... You wonder how things move on stage. You'd love, at least I would love, to get behind the scenes and watch what's going on behind the curtain. Well, here in this passage, it's like God's drawing back the curtain a little bit so that we can see what's going on backstage. We witness the action of the spiritual world when God's people pray in faith. So when Daniel prayed... God answered. Verse 4. On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing on the bank of the Tigris River, and I looked up, and there was a, a man dressed in linen with a belt of gold, upaz, around his waist. His body was like burl, and his face was like the brilliance of lightning, his eyes like the flaming torches, his, his arms like feet, like the... the and feet like gleam, the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words are like the sound of a multitude. And only I, Daniel, saw the vision. I can't help but compare this passage to Revelation chapter 1, verse 14, 
where John has this vision of Jesus. And he uses this word, these words to describe him. His hair was white like wool, white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. I mean, that's, that really is, is the same description as what Daniel gives us. And it's my understanding as I read this, and, and some might disagree, but it's my understanding this is a, a vision of the pre-incarnate Christ that Daniel is given. There's also in the story an angel who speaks to and ministers to Daniel's needs. But he sees and he speaks to the Lord, right? He, he refers to him as Lord. And, and so I, I do see this as, as a gift that God gives Daniel to encourage and help him, is that God himself comes to him. But notice how Daniel... Then Daniel prays how he, he comes to God. He comes to God humbly. That he fasts, humbling himself, mourning, and then God gives him grace. His prayers are marked by that humility. And I would simply remind you the truth that we're given in Scripture is that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And if we're honest, when we think about our prayers... Say we're not always humble when we come to God in prayer. Oftentimes we rush into his presence with our petitions without ever even responding to the reality of his presence. Sometimes our attitude is like, hey God, I'm here to talk to you, so you need to listen to me now. Because I don't have much time. <laughs> no, you don't say it that way. I promise you it comes across that way. <laughs> Think about it. How much of your time in prayer is actually given to responding to the presence of God? Hebrews tells us that when we pray, we're entering into the very heavenly throne room of Almighty God. If we would understand the, the spiritual reality of that promise, then I think we would pause as we cross the threshold into prayer in humility, in confession, in praise and worship with thanksgiving. I have you also notice from our text that, that God heard Daniel's prayers from the very first day, right away. Uh, right away the angel was sent. Now I don't understand how God's response is hindered. I don't, I don't understand that. But the revelation given to us here indicates that it can be. And I believe this passage is, is recorded so that we would understand that we need to be faithful in our praying. That there is simply to understand there is more going on than, than meets the eye. More going on than we can understand. That the spiritual battles are real and we cannot fight them in flesh and blood. So we must learn that praying in faith is, is a primary spiritual weapon that's placed in our arsenal. Verse 13, but the prince of Persia, the Persian kingdom, resisted me for 21 days, and then Michael, one of the chief priests, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. This is the angel speaking here. And a, sp a spirit being, talking about a spiritual battle, the being, being a demon, is, he refers to as the prince of Persia, a battle that lasts for 21 days until Michael comes and assists him. Paul tries to help us understand that spiritual reality in Ephesians 6, familiar text I trust to you, when he writes, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That list that Paul gives us speaks of spiritual organization, that, that Satan is real, that Satan is intelligent, that his attack, attacks are organized through rulers and princes and authorities and powers. 
you and I are to be aware of his stream, of his schemes, because our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But here's the other thing you need to see. This struggle, we do not struggle alone. But the angels of God struggle with us. They take up positions to protect us. Jesus, is in, own, in his own words, Matthew 18, so see that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven are always see the face of my Father in heaven. It's important that we open the eyes of our faith, see the spiritual realities. Because the truth is, Satan wants you to, to believe that these things don't matter. He wants you to think in, in abstract ways about who he is, that he's just a silly guy in a red suit, that you wouldn't worry about such nonsense. But the scriptures say this is not nonsense, this is real. You are spiritually alive in Jesus Christ, and because of that spiritual life within you, Satan is against you. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in its place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith which, with which you're able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be always alert and keep on praying for the saints. You see in that instruction the importance of prayer, prominence of prayer. It's a spiritual resource and weapon for anyone who's seeking to live for God in your home in your workplace in your school friend you can expect that Satan is going to resist he'll resist anything that brings glory to God the faithful Jews are being resisted in Jerusalem Daniel's prayers and the answers to those prayers were being resisted friend you can expect that Satan will resist you. He will make things as hard as he can. He'll seek to distract you and discourage you. He'll raise up people to ridicule you. You are in his sights if you're in Christ and you're spiritually alive. So be aware of these things, not, not fearfully, no. What I want you to understand is that there is power, resources available to you, and they come to us in and through prayer. And I would just also say, don't, don't be discouraged by the fact that Satan resists you. Because he resisted Jesus, too. Throughout his earthly ministry, we see uh, Satan resisting Jesus. And Jesus is the one who said, uh, the servant is not greater than the master. All right? we, we will face the same things that he faced. It's a part of who we are in Christ. We simply don't want to be a hindrance ourselves. Satan will seek to hindrance, hinder us and hinder the gospel through us. That's fine, just as long as we are not the hindrance. And when Jesus came to Nazareth, his hometown, he was not able to do any good work there because of their lack of faith. He was hindered because the people there did not believe. They didn't have faith. And I point that out to you to say this, this is the spiritual reality. There's a role of prayer. There's an importance of faith. And we are to pray in faith because that's where power is. But when we pray in faith, what we discover here in, in Daniel chapter 10 is that angels are dispatched and demons are overpowered. Hebrews 1.14 Reminds us that angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. That's you and me. We inherit salvation through Jesus Christ. And God's angels are ministering spirits that have been sent to serve us. They are ministering spirits, meaning they are created spiritual beings. They have specific tasks and jobs. And one of those jobs is to take care of you. Isn't that good? Isn't that a wonderful awareness? 
Now, why then? Why then do we seek to live in our own strength? And because we do, because we're living in our own strength, often we're defeated, we're worried, we're weak, and we simply need our eyes opened tonight. Oh, I wish it would, would happen for you as it did for the prophet of Elijah's servant, is your eyes would be open to these spiritual realities. You remember that story in 2 Kings chapter 6? Wonderful story. The servant of the Lord goes out in the morning and, and he looks up and he sees that the, there's an army with horses and chariots that have surrounded the city and surrounded the prophet. And fearfully he runs into the servant Elisha and says, Father, Father, we're surrounded. But Elisha says, Don't be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with him. And Elisha prayed in verse 17, 2 Kings 6, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Brother and sister, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And when we pray in faith, God strengthens us, and God saves us. Verse 18, again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, O man highly esteemed, he said. Peace, be strong now, be strong. And when he spoke to me, I was strengthened. Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. I... I want you to hear a couple things here. I want you to hear how, how the Lord spoke of Daniel. When Daniel came to him in prayer, his response was, Servant, you are precious in the eyes of the Lord. I want you to understand that about you who are in Christ. You are precious to the Lord. He, he has paid for you through the precious blood of his Son. You are precious to him. And when you, come, when you come to him in prayer, as a child comes to his father in faith, the Lord receives you as such. He receives you as precious to him. And he'll strengthen you, encourage you. Three times Daniel was strengthened in this chapter. And the angel ministering strength to him we see that repeated throughout scriptures as the angels were sent to strengthen Moses or to strengthen Elijah or even to strengthen Jesus. The prayer of faith opens these doors of strength. So I'd ask you tonight, are you praying faithfully? Are you faithfully praying? Daniel was praying for the salvation of Israel. And God would show him in a vision how he was going to do that work of saving the Jews. And we'll look at that next time as we come into these next two chapters. But let me ask you this. Are you praying faithfully? Are you praying for someone? Then don't give up. You're praying for someone's salvation. Don't quit. Keep praying. The daughter of a woman who was baptized, and the pastor shared the story. He said, I, I bumped into this woman in the stairwell, his daughter, and, and she was crying, and it seemed really strange to me. I, I thought it was odd since the, the service had been so joyful. And I asked her if she was okay, and she said, well, not really. She said, I, I, I'm struggling. She said, my mom was baptized today, and that, that's, that's wonderful, but Here's the truth. He said, I, I prayed for her for every day for 20 years. And the reason I'm crying is because I came so close to giving up. So after five years, I, I kept saying, who needs this? God's not listening to me. After 10 years, I, was, I kept saying, why am I wasting my breath? After 15 years, I thought it was absurd. And at the 19-year mark, I said to myself, I'm a fool. But I just kept trying. I just kept praying. And even with weak faith, I prayed. And then here she is today. She's given her life to cry as she was baptized. 
I can never doubt the power of prayer again. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power, demolishing strongholds. Brother and sister, that power is available to you and me. And so we should pray faithfully, and we should pray by faith. Would you join me as we prepare uh, to come into the Lord's presence with petitions and intercessions? Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your word and how it encourages our hearts. We thank you that you help us to see the spiritual realities around us. We confess to you that oftentimes we live by our flesh. We try to accomplish things that we say we're doing for you, but but we're not doing it in your strength because we're not praying. Oftentimes we face our own problems with our own understanding. Lord, we hinder what you can do for us. Father, forgive us. We desire to repent of that and turn to faithfully pray and to pray by faith. Lord, I, I pray for those that are listening tonight, and maybe those who have been discouraged because they feel like their prayers are not being heard. Help them to understand by faith. Help them to see with their spiritual eyes, Lord, that you hear them, that they're precious in your sight, but that there are more things going on around us than we can see. So we trust you. Even when it seems like the wait is long, we'll wait on you. We'll not give up. Lord, give us strength when we're weak. Carry us forward when we want to, when we fall down. And so, Lord, we come trusting in you, asking for your cleansing tonight. We come to bring petitions to you, asking that you would hear us. And we thank you for your faithfulness to us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask Pastor Dave to come and lead us in petition and intercession for our church family. Um, there are many that we need to pray for, and, and maybe, maybe we need to pray for you. And, and so if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube and you can make comments, maybe a petition that you'd want to share with us, please take opportunity to do that tonight. Or, or certainly uh, write us an email or, or call the church. Uh, we, we want to know how to pray for you. Dave, would you come and lead us? Church, if you would just join me in a, in a time of intercession and, and as we, as a church family, lift up these requests to the Lord, would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we come before you tonight uh, knowing that you are a good, good father. Lord, you desire to meet the needs of your children, and we thank you for that. So, Father, we, we come before you, Lord, first of all, asking for your, your grace in our lives personally. Lord, I'm not sure what each one who's, who's watching this is wrestling with or, or what their burdens may be, Lord, but I ask that you would meet each of them according to your riches in glory. Lord, I pray for faith for each of us, that we would learn to trust you more, that our faith would be demonstrated in how we pray. Lord, that, that we pray recognizing you alone have all the resources of heaven and earth. And Lord, all power in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus, and, and you have promised to be with us always. So Lord, may that encourage our faith. May we learn to pray in faith, and may we persevere in that, Lord. Uh, that we would be obedient to you and your call upon our lives to pray. Lord, we know that we need to fight. The, the battle that we fight is a spiritual battle, so we need to fight it in prayer, Lord. Father, we, we just ask that we would be faithful as a church to the Great Commission, to, to making disciples, to sharing the good news with our community, with the neighbors that are around us, with our, our co-workers, with our family, with our friends. Lord, I pray for, for salvation to come as we are faithful to proclaim your good news about Jesus. And Lord, that you would grant faith 
to, to those that we've been praying for, maybe just that we've met recently, or maybe those that we've known for our whole life. Lord, that we would pray and not give up because you are faithful. You desire that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance so we can pray in faith. Father, we, we lift up the needs of those in our, in our church family. Lord, we desire that you would meet these needs according to your will and, and by your great grace. Father, we pray for Miss Billy Parker, Lord, that's having surgery uh, for an endometrial cancer tomorrow. Lord, we just pray that this treatment would be sufficient, and Lord, that you would heal her. She would not need any further treatments. Father, we thank you for your protection and grace in her life and just ask that you would encourage her heart. Father, we thank you for protecting Jan Monday. And after having a heart attack, Lord, we thank you that she's recovering at home. Lord, we just ask that you would give her grace and help her to uh, just to heal, to recover from that fully. Father, for Pam Denise, we're praying for her as she's uh, beginning new treatment for her breast cancer. Lord, we just ask that your hand of healing would be upon her that the treatment would be effective, and Lord, that you would grant healing. Father, we're just asking for your grace to J.W. fight as, as he's uh, waiting on, on the U of M board uh, uh, for brain tumors to, to s determine how to proceed with his treatment. Father, we pray for wisdom for that team. We pray for patience for J.W., and, and Lord, we pray for your hand of healing to be on him. Uh, Lord, be with his family as they support him through this journey. Encourage them in faith. Father, we're praying for the recovery also of Shirley Utter, Lord, that you would give her grace and strength, encourage her heart, and grant her healing. And Father, for Amy Craft, we're just asking for her, uh, just your hand to be upon her during the surgery that she'll have uh, on Monday to replace uh, just two discs in her neck, Lord. We know she's been... Um, just in need of, of healing in that, so we're just asking your, your grace to be with her. We thank you for her. Father, be with uh, Bob Rowland and his family and, and as they grieve the loss of, of his brother. We know that you can meet their needs. Father, we just continue to lift up to you uh, Bernita Fuller as, as she's continuing through treatments. We pray for uh, John Lewis and uh, as he continues just day by day, uh, Lord, just struggle in his health. Lord, we just pray that you would strengthen him and, and continue to be with his family. Father, for Annette Melton, Lord, just continue to be with her as, as she's uh, in recovery at home. Lord, just strengthen her, encourage her, grant her grace and, and peace each and every day. Father, we, we come before you because we, we believe uh, in, in praying to you, Lord, because you are God. You are in control. And, Lord, you are able to do abundantly more than all we can ask or imagine. So, Lord, we pray that you would, according to the powerful name of Jesus, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church, for praying with us tonight. Thank you, Pastor Dave. And I, I hope that the, the time of intercession and the sharing of, of needs uh, would lead you to be faithful in prayer each day that we continue to pray for one another regularly, not, not just on Wednesday nights, but e each day as we come to the Lord and enter into his presence. I want to encourage you to be in prayer about uh, Sunday uh, services. Uh, we'll be wrapping up our series of messages on uh, the invitation to the Lord's table, to come to the table. This Sunday we're going to be looking uh, at this is an ordinance, the Lord's Supper is an ordinance, which means a command of Christ, and that, that when we come to the Lord's table, that there is an expectation that we've responded in obedience to the other ordinances, other ordinance that Christ gave us, and that is baptism. And so we're, we're going to talk about um, baptism on Sunday and how it, how it relates to our, both our spiritual walk with Christ, uh, to the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, and to the church. And so it might be a good opportunity for you to invite somebody uh, to join you if you want to do, uh, if you, to bring them with you to worship service or to do a watch party in your home, uh, to watch together, and that the Lord might uh, use his word to uh, continue to work through us for the sake of the gospel and the kingdom. So as, I, as we dismiss tonight, I just, I just want to pray uh, over you a, a prayer of benediction, if I could. 
Lord, I pray that you'd grant each one according to your riches and glory that they would be strengthened, my brothers and sisters, would be strengthened in power in their inner being through the Spirit and that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. Lord, I pray that they'd be rooted and firmly established in love, that they would be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of God's love. Lord, that they would know Christ's love, the surpassing knowledge, so that they'd be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, and according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Have a wonderful night in the Lord. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday.